Push record twice, it doesn't work. I mean, can you actually see our faces with full light in the background? Yeah. It's an iPhone 14 X. This has got like a zillion. Pro. It's got like a zillion doing, bits of uh, dynamic it's, range. It's doing all kinds of computations inside there, far beyond the range of mere normal, mortal normal cameras. Yeah. All right, ready? Go for it. Good morning, Bitcoins. This is Proof of Work, a show about the people behind Bitcoin and how they got here. Today, we're joined by Peter Todd. How's it going, Peter? Well, I feel very worky right now. So proof. It's good to be in Majorca, and it's good to have something to do. So, Peter, we're going to go ahead and start with everyone's most favorite and familiar question. What was your first computer? Well, myself, obviously. <laughs> I mean, the term computer comes from the people who computed. That's right. They and, would do the... Uh, yeah. The calculations on yeah. board ships to launch missiles and yeah, the trajectories and I so forth. I mean, forth. mainly, you know, in big rooms sitting at a desk. But, yeah. You know, and like I learned how to do basic arithmetic probably mm -hmm. in what, grade one or something. Yeah. So obviously I was the computer. My teacher always told me that I wouldn't always have a calculator around. And throughout my entire life, I've done nothing but prove her wrong. I'm surrounded yeah. by calculators. Yeah, yeah. Right on your... Uh, calculator I mean, on my watch. Gr granted, like I am... Young enough mm. that calculator watches were cool. It was I'm cool. I'm also old enough that calculator watches were cool. Yeah, it was good times. But after you found yourself as a computer, what was the first other computer that you used? Well, obviously my teacher, because my teacher could do computing for me. Yeah, they were not very helpful in playing video games, though. Well, you know, I mean, there's a type of video game they're good at. It's called pretend. They do pretend. Yeah. So what was it? Probably an IBM 486, Pentium? Nah, IBM XT, man. Oh. You gotta, you gotta like keep it real. Like 8086? Like... Yeah, yeah, they were um, 8086s. Um, my particular one was like a really souped up one because yeah. it was being used, uh, as far as I could tell, as uh, like a netware uh, share with nice. like actual ethernet. And, Whoa, uh, not a coax, drive. huh? Real ethernet. Yeah, yeah, real coax ethernet, yeah. like with the full oh, the, the connectors. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you had to terminate the end of the line or yeah. you couldn't play uh, Quake properly. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of things did you do when you got the computer? Oh, I mean, I, I learned like basic programming. Yeah. And basic programming mean basic, basic programming. Mm. Go to and this line and print yep. commands yep. and basic math. Yeah, didn't have internet access so no one could tell me that uh, go to is considered harmful. Sure. Well, there wasn't a lot of other options at that point, but I do remember well, they I used mean, to when I, when, I, when I got an IBM XT, they were worth like 50 bucks. <laughs> so, so it was late in, the, yeah, late in the game. Yeah, it was quite now. late, yeah. And what else did you do with it beyond basic programming? Yeah, learned about DOS, you know, yeah. learned command, command lines. Command line, yeah. move files around, yeah. copy files. Yeah, play a bit of games, but not much. Nice. Yep. I remember I used to play uh, SimCity on a 286, and our yeah. trick is we'd let the city run overnight and that way you would get Sim more City money. SimCity or SimCity 2000? Original SimCity. Yeah, yeah. I remember when SimCity 2000 came out and it was a big deal and it was so much more complicated with the, the pipe layer underneath yeah. and the electrical and the yeah. additional challenges. Yeah, my but first SimCity was 2000. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Very good graphics on that yeah. one. Not quite a DOS-based command line game. Well, I mean, the graphics, like, they got in just good enough they look good. Mm -hmm. Also, they had the clever trick of um, palette animation. Yeah. So you could have the, the blinky likes do their thing and they're actually swapping the palette entries out. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I remember the original SimCity, one of its copyright protections is that it had a red card with the code on. So yeah. red with black text was almost impossible to photocopy. Yeah. But we found a way. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that hard. Yeah. So that's great. You had the 8086, your programming. Uh, where did it lead to? Do you keep working with computers or do you fall away? I know a lot of people want to be programmers but then don't become it or maybe they I mean, become one later. The, these days I seem to give a lot of talks in some ways you could say I fell away from that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't spend, you know, I spend some of my time programming but I spend mm -hmm. a lot of my time on other like consulting it's, things and of course we're quite literally giving talks, giving classes. So It's strange, know. I remember a time where I used to spend eight hours a day on the computer or more just at the desk. Uh, at work, at night, at the computer labs, yep. just into it. And then now, yeah, it's, it's almost like a, a vacation or a break where I'm like, I didn't use my laptop today. You know, sure, I read email, I read news, I'm on my phone, I'm on yeah. Twitter, 
but I let the laptop have a break, which yeah. previously was unheard of. Yeah. So once well, you're using it every day and you're using it all the time, how did you go from being into computers to being into Bitcoin? Well, in between, I somehow got a fine arts degree and also worked as an electrical engineer. What kind of so, things did you do as a fine arts degree? Uh, I hear that you've made some mighty fine pots. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, at one point I was uh, teaching a pottery class, <laughs> but uh, I also wound up uh, making basically a lot of clocks. Yeah. And then uh, somehow I wound up at a geophysics startup, mm. um, making a new type of gravity sensor. Wow. Yeah. Clocks are fascinating. I know when they took apart Big Ben recently for the restoration, they found many of the arms had shillings and other small weights attached to them to allow the giant clock to keep functioning. What yeah, well, what you want to, um, well, I mean, uh, the stuff I did was like with electronics. I've, I've never done any, uh, like, like physical clocks. Yeah, well, yeah. hardware, like mechanical yeah. ones, but yeah. there, there are neat things, but they are a lot of work to make. Mm. Like if you build anything mechanical, you soon realize how nice software is. Yeah, yeah. You can just iterate, make changes, keep yep. going. Yep. Well, you know, you know, electronics is the same deal. Like the the speed at which you can iterate on software mm. is just so much better. And, and also, like, you get much more visibility. I mean, I was frequently doing electronics where it was physically impossible to inspect the state of the circuit mm. in a way that mattered. Because, yeah. you know, you'd be making a circuit where you're trying to go measure something where the signal is like a countable number of electrons. <laughs> now, a very high count, you know, probably yeah. like a million per second or so, but a million per second electrons is a tiny, tiny, tiny current. And the moment you go put a probe on that to try to measure something about that circuit, you have a much bigger influence to the circuit than the thing you're trying to measure in the first place. Yeah. So you wind up having to do a lot of basic experiments. <laughs> like if the circuit isn't doing what you think it's doing, make a slightly different circuit that maybe will reveal some aspect of its operation, see if that works, or at least if it doesn't work, figure out what it's doing, and then try to use that knowledge to understand your original, your original problem. Do you think oh. this kind of knowledge made you a, a better programmer, like having this trial and error Well, approach? I mean, a better, I wouldn't necessarily say a better programmer, but a better like Bitcoin engineer, if you will. Yeah. Because um, a lot of stuff in Bitcoin, it's it's not very easy to measure. Mm -hmm. You really gotta under. You, I mean, you really gotta have confidence in making models. Yeah. And understanding what models can do, how the math works for making models, and so on. Because you know, when you're talking about something on Bitcoin, it's not like you can just boot up a second copy of Bitcoin and test it out. Right? Yeah. 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 You can do testnet, but testnet doesn't have the same economics mm -hmm. or you know other parameters. So. Yeah. The inf yeah. I wouldn't hack you on testnet. I would wait until you got on the mainnet, and then I would hack yep. you so I could steal the yep. money. Of Particularly course. things yeah. like um, arguments around block size, as an example. Mm. You know, I I got involved in the block size debate very early. In the block size debate, one way to think about it is was in terms of well, models for how Bitcoin could work. Because obviously, you can go turn up a number and say, "Hey, the software works." But it's a very different argument than saying that no, the system as a whole works. You definitely have to test it out that way. So after you were working on the gravity sensor and learning that you preferred software to hardware, what no, did you I wouldn't do say next? that. No? no, I wouldn't say I preferred software to hardware. Mm -hmm. No more. I mean, I learned about Bitcoin like maybe 2009, but mm -hmm. around 2012, 2013, I was, you know, I had a bit more free time to go look at it more. Yeah. And around 2014, I made the decision. Well, look, I'm not good enough at electronics to make anything new yeah. because it's such a mature industry. Mm. Whereas I seem to be good enough at Bitcoin stuff to make advancements in that industry. So I jumped ship and went to the easier thing. Yeah. And I'd definitely say that Bitcoin is an easier thing to be involved in than like analog electronics. The, the math behind it, the system behind it, or they're just simpler. Sure. It's interesting that you know, even with you, you didn't get in right away. You read about it, it took a few years, it kind of gestated. Not what really. No, I mean, I, I read about it and it was very clear to me, this is obviously going to work. Yeah. In fact, so you didn't see a place for you right away. Right? Well, I mean, I, you know, I was working at a startup and also trying to go do a physics degree at the same sure. time. So very I was busy, very busy yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, Bitcoin, while it obviously could work, it still hadn't be gotten to the point where things were really happening that much. Whereas as things started to catch on, you know, I kind of got back into it and started being more actively involved. 
that's what I kind of felt watching it from afar where I knew right away it was really interesting, but I didn't get in, I didn't buy it, I didn't really understand the details. And then a few years later when Coinbase and BitPay were there, I was like, oh, I understand that this could be for normal people, not just computer geeks, yeah. World of Warcraft money, but like yeah. anybody could use this. And that's when I got excited about all the possibilities of the world using it. And even just for me, the simple idea of making a YouTube show, putting up a QR code, and then you don't have to pay Google, you don't have to pay YouTube. You could pay the taxes, of course, but the money comes could. through the screen to you, to your little wallet. And you know, even if it's just a dollar, it was just so neat to see that option be there for content creators. And even if yeah. you make a, a poster or a printed object, you put a QR code or write an address out manually, someone could send you money. Of course, the sad thing about that story is everything you've said could be done with centralized systems, but for some reason, for the most part, it hasn't. You know, well, there, there are some exceptions. Yeah, you don't want to bypass the other systems. Well, there are, there are some exceptions. I mean, in uh, China's example, you know, certain like, uh, things with like WeChat Pay tend to go through QR codes, but mm -hmm. For the most part, even centralized systems, they've never bothered competing with Bitcoin on what Bitcoin does really well. You know, it's very easy to go pay you with Bitcoin, yeah. and yet it should be easy to go pay you with PayPal, sure. but they refuse to go make this possible. And I think that shows both how captured these systems are by regulatory interests that just do not want it to be easy to go pay, as well as captured by their own kind of monopolistic um, interests where you know, PayPal can charge a lot of money for payment. Sure. The tech could charge a lot less, but they choose not to. Well, I don't know that normal people even think about or realize that there's a payments industry out there and that there's companies, not just, of course, Visa and MasterCard, we all use those, but there's a whole, you know, establishment yep. at Money 2020, I would see them, of these massive payment companies that are doing incredible things that the average Incredible middleman just, things. Incredible middleman things, yes. They're, they're facilitating a lot of transactions, perhaps not in the most efficient way, yeah. uh, but they're definitely getting their cut and more so. so. And, and I also got to point out, I mean, the way the regulations work, um, I've heard that PayPal winds up spending like 10 cents per transaction on compliance. Mm. And it's uh, a spend that scales roughly per transaction because of how much stupid human you know, in, insight they go put Absolutely, into this stuff. Yeah. And they hire armies of people to go audit stuff. And it's just, none of this is necessary but it's imposed on the payments industry by very burdensome regulations. So now that you're into Bitcoin and you felt that you could create something, what did you try to create? Well, um, the very first code that I wrote, like the directly used Bitcoin was open timestamps. And Excellent. that's just a tool to prove date exists in the past. Now timestamps are very important. I used to work for corporate lawyers all of our documents were about timestamps, all of our schedules, calendars, all this information. If you could tell when a document came from, you had an incredible amount of information, especially in a chain of Of course, of in your example, well, that none of the timestamps you're talking about were secure. You know, you, you might have a literal stamp with a time on it, but you know, we, that's we would, still not good. We'd seize the laptop, we'd yeah. use a forensic process to yeah. get the data off there, yeah. and then we would use the copy that we would assume, yeah. again, is the yeah. best possible representation yeah. of truth. But no, it's not yeah. as Cryptographic good. Cryptographic timestamps. How would open so timestamps have been better? If I'd put my document on there and then showed my lawyer the open timestamps, would, would he have been excited? I mean, the main better? thing is, so, you know, when you actually timestamp something for real cryptographically, mm -hmm. it's not possible to modify it later. Yes. And so, you know, so much legal stuff is really based on trust. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at how things are introduced into courts, usually it's, well, some guy just makes a statement saying, oh yeah, this is real. Sure. And then sometimes the other side says, no, it's not. And, and after in, that point, it's just a mess. They bring in experts and both the experts say it's real and not real, and they're both equal experts. So. Yeah, and like there aren't, there just aren't good mechanisms for a lot of this stuff. Mm. And most of the court, I mean, a lot of the courts, the, what it really runs on is the fact that both sides are kind of holding each other hostage, saying, hey, if you start disputing this, yeah, yeah. it'll suddenly become very expensive. That's right. You're much better off just admitting it was real. Yep. Of course, then you get really weird cases where you can have examples where both sides in a court case actually want to go and agree to a false document. And there's, there's weird stuff that happens then because neither side has an incentive to tell the truth. Sure. So in a world of the future where open timestamps would be wi widely and broadly used, 
courts could then accurately say for real, for true, that a document was produced on such and such a date, right? Yeah, but you have to parse that statement very carefully because a timestamp proof proves that a piece of data exists in the past. Yes. It does not prove that that was the only piece of data. I mean, we could create a, a hash of the document and put the hash in there and it would match up. I mean, well, I mean, so a very simple example is let's suppose we make a bet. Mm -hmm. And I bet you I know what lottery numbers there will be in the future. Okay. And I want to go prove this with a timestamp. I'm going to go timestamp my guess. Yes. Of course, I could just timestamp every possible guess at once. I've seen that on Twitter. When you lose, you delete the losers. Exactly. <laughs> yep. And if, if what you're timestamping is vulnerable to that kind of attack, timestamping is not a very, I mean, it, it's better than nothing, yeah. but the amount it's better by nothing is not very much. Not very much. You know, at least it means at least I'd go put in a little bit more effort, but it's not much more effort. Yeah. On the other hand, in other cases, um, there's plenty of examples of documents where there really is no realistic way that I would have known how to go fake it in advance. Yeah. And you know, depending on what sort of document you're talking about, it's usually somewhere in between. Um, a very nice example of timestamping that works extremely well is to timestamp digital signatures. There you go. Because the problem with a digital signature is. Well, digital signature, the security relies on the private key used mm -hmm. to sign it being kept secure. Now, secondarily, the security also relies on having the right public key in the first place. Yeah, but yeah. if you can agree on that, then you've got to have the private key being secure. Well, timestamping means that if your key is compromised later, mm -hmm. after the signature was created, yeah. if you can roughly figure out when that key was compromised, prior to the compromise, you can at least still validate signatures. And this mm -hmm. is why... Bitcoin Core's example has been timestamping uh, Git commits and releases, ah. along along with a bunch of other projects. Uh, LND does this too. I believe C Lightning does this. Um, you know, a bu bunch of stuff. I think Wasabi as well. Nice. I mean, of course, I timestamp all my Git commits. There you go. I wrote the software. Well, and that's one of the great things about software is when you start getting into it, you write things for yourself. I wrote like a little blog entry entry thing because I wanted to blog. I wanted to publish my stuff. And in the same way, you wrote open timestamps. So what did you do next? Well, I mean, I made sure open timestamps kept running. I mean, I continued to go work on open timestamps related stuff. In fact, um, it was what, yeah, three, two, yeah, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. three weeks ago, I was in Guatemala mm -hmm. um, helping a group timestamp election results. Yeah. So in Guatemala, like many places, it's a paper ballot system. Yeah. And each voting booth, voting table, whatever, they get paper ballots, they collect the ballots, yep. manually count them, and they fill out a little sheet sure. with how many votes for each candidate. Okay. That sheet gets put into a scanner and then scanned into a central database. Right. And that's the preliminary election results. Okay. There's other checks on top of this, but you know, that's the that's the main one. Mm -hmm. So we created a system I mean, frankly, more my client created the system. I created open timestamps. Yeah, yeah. They create a system where, as those documents were scanned in, they'd also be timestamped. And what this proves is that particular document exists in the past. And that proves it independently of the preliminary election system. So now, if, I, if I edit the election database, say we've lost the results from sector 15, you could go back and say, but we have a timestamp that there was well, a document. Well, frankly, the main thing you would go to say is, and of course, and to be exact, I mean, what, it, what apparently has happened is a bunch of documents, like uh, you know, a bunch of these summary documents, yeah. were taken away to a third party, a third party place, and returned back hours later. Yeah. Then they were put into the system. Sure. And time stamping can't prove that the documents that that happens to yeah. are false. Yeah. But what it can prove is that all the other documents that were scanned in and have much earlier timestamps, mm -hmm. very close to when the polls were supposed to close, yeah. those documents are much less likely to be fake. And in this particular case, the suspicion is that the political party that was losing mm -hmm. wanted to throw the whole election. Uh -huh. So they stole a bunch of ballots, very obviously modified them, yeah. put them into the system, and on that basis, they now want to redo the entire election. Of course, kick the can down the road. We exactly. can rerun get, our campaign. You know, maybe next time up. they'll yeah. have more thugs who yeah. go and take more ballots, right? Yeah. And in this case, timestamping at least gives some reason to say, hey, that didn't happen to the entire country. 
let's just redo the election in now, the, the district. Now the big question though, is it gonna fix the problem in real time or is it just gonna tell us historically they had a good or a bad election? How close are we to helping people with Well, this? I mean, the bigger issue here is that my understanding is basically the, the party you managed to go do this. It's not clear that like the results will be respected. Because you know, with all these systems, I mean, if you don't respect the results of the election, if not enough society agrees to go through this whole charade, yeah. I mean, nothing really happens. I mean, in any in any country, you know, you can run an election, and then people collectively decide, well, that never happened. All right, we're going to put someone entirely different in charge, right? So it's a small part of the evidence required to convince society and other factors, hey, you should respect the results of the election, except you lost. Yeah. yeah. But we'll see what happens. Very interesting. I also know uh, you were involved in something dramatic, uh, replaced by fee, RBF. Oh yeah. Well, that, that's this whole other uh, whole uh, another issue. What's the the general idea? If I had a transaction, maybe I didn't put enough uh, satoshis, I didn't pay enough fees, I could pay a higher fee. Well, I mean, so the big thing to understand there is when you broadcast a transaction, it doesn't get into the blockchain instantly. Right. I mean, it's broadcast around mempools of nodes all around the network, and nodes send transactions from one mempool to another. Yep. And it's uh, what's you know would be termed a comp sci flood fill algorithm. Mm -hmm. But so you've broadcast transaction now it's sitting around in various mempools. Yeah. In many cases, you might want to replace the transaction with a different one. I mean, maybe you know you want to encourage miners to actually mine it. Right. right, maybe you might want to increase the well, fee. Well, because maybe I paid too little, yeah. I want it to go yeah. faster now. Yeah, because yeah. the process of going from a mempool to a block, it's a bidding system. Yeah. All right, you are trying to convince miners, hey, please mine my transactions because you're going to earn more money. Yep. And miners are paid transaction fees. So if you are willing to pay a higher fee, you encourage them to put your transaction in their block. And for the most part, miners basically take all valid transactions they know about, order them by fee, Hmm. and put them into a block, with the one exception of kind of for historical reasons, mo for like when Bitcoin was created, there was a way to replace transactions and mempools. Yeah. That shipped in the earliest version of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But the technical details of that way were completely broken hmm. because it involved just comparing a number in the transaction inputs called end sequence. Yeah. And end sequence is 32 bits, so 4 billion okay. um, ma maximum integer which meant you could broadcast transaction with an input with an end sequence of zero yeah. and replace it four billion times, Wow! which uses up a lot of bandwidth. Sure. So obviously that idea was stupid. You know, it just, it didn't work. Yeah. And Satoshi got rid of it. But in the meantime, transaction replacement was still useful. So as far as we can tell, Satoshi might have proposed this first. It's mm -hmm. kind of hard to say. Yeah. Um, so, you know, someone, you know, probably multiple people independently invented this, but the idea, well, why don't we just say you accept the transaction for the highest fee? Excuse me, right? sorry to interrupt, but do you guys, by any chance, have an HDMI to U, um, USB adapter because they're looking for one? No. no. Okay. I've never heard of an HDMI to USB adapter. Oh, yeah, they're a thing these days. I have, like, HDMI to HDMI. Yeah, yeah HDMI to USB is a thing. Hmm. So, yeah, with replacement fees. So, so he had, Satoshi had a system, it didn't work. Yeah. Second version, third version, you come along. Well, I mean, there was, there was only a second version, sure. right? I mean, right. the obvious thing to do is just mine the transaction with highest fee. Right. Like, well, I mean, that's, you, you don't need was, to think very hard say, about this. You know, this is another, obvious. It's just another example, but that's how like Uber Eats works. If you put a higher tip, they'll take your dinner order faster and they'll bring you your food quicker which is how things should work, right? Well, in theory, I'm not sure it actually works that way. I think it's in a market. I, I, imagine, I think they're looking at the tips because in the very same way that you're talking about, my transaction's not I mean, getting picked at least, up. At least the way tip is too small. At least the way I've looked to do reads, you couldn't put a tip in advance, but me, I haven't actually looked oh, at no, it. Oh, no, yeah, that. they have it in advance. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, and they're, and they're yeah. judging you. Obviously, judging I, don't, you. I don't look too hard at this stuff. But anyway, sure. with, mo with transactions, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Highest fee. Yeah. Now, there's some technical nuance in how exactly you implement this, because remember, there's not like there's the mempool. There's a whole bunch of mempools. Yeah. So if I go give your node a transaction with a very slightly higher fee, yeah. it might be such a small difference, you might not want to accept it. Because then it's the same like DOS tech network. So yeah. there's a few rules around that, but the, the, the details aren't too important. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that in between this, we allow transaction replacement, and now we do replacement fee. For a while, there was a period where there wasn't a transaction replacement mechanism. Mm -hmm. 
And that caused a political problem because people thought, well, hang on a second. If I go send you a transaction, there's no way to double spend you. You can just accept my money. And a lot of people started to rely on this. Mm. Now, quickly, people realize this isn't such a good idea because there's lots of ways to double spend an unconfirmed and I could, transaction. This is, these are people sending zero fee transactions. Well, I mean, there's a lot of variants of this, yeah. but you know, very low fee. Well, the main point is that people figured that if you broadcast transaction, it's secure. It'll get in. It'll get mined. Oh, and the, if I could buy the Ferrari in five minutes. And yeah, I yeah. Kind of well, in particular, the whole story. Oh, we'll go buy a coffee on chain, and you know, yeah, you've got. And you know, this idea doesn't work. This is why, for the most part, when you go to an ATM, and you go and buy cash with Bitcoin, yeah. they're going to wait for confirmation. Yeah. Because there's all kinds of ways you can double spend that transaction. Definitely. In fact, there was a ATM uh, company in Canada. Mm -hmm that got hit by this problem a couple of years ago, and they lost like a quarter of a million dollars wow. due to repeated double spends. And you know, this was, my understanding, this was a reasonably short time period before there was, oh shit, we're losing all this money, we better turn this off. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, well, it did you not can, work you can for see, them. You can see their argument, no one likes to wait around the Quickie Mart for 10 minutes to yeah, get their Bitcoin, well, or an hour, or two hours, whatever it may be. I mean, they can but, argue all they want, but the system doesn't work, <laughs> it doesn't work. That's right. And, the other thing is that with multi-party transactions, we really want to replace by fee to be on all the time because let's suppose you and I are creating a coin join. Yeah. Now, you go pay a reasonable fee, I go pay a reasonable fee, mm -hmm. but then I double spend the transaction with a much lower fee. Now, if I manage to get my double spend broadcast first to the majority of hashing power, uh -huh. it's gonna take a long time before the coin join either fails mm -hmm. or gets mined. And this is a nightmare. Because you can have a you know coin join transaction with like a hundred people yeah. and it just mysteriously nothing happens. It's far better if either you know the double spender pays a high fee and then you know they fairly pay to double spend and they lose money doing it. Or the coin join pays a higher fee and it just replaces the double spend and then you get progress made. Yeah. And you know, fact is, like coin joins, they're always going to fail a lot because people can refuse to sign the second round. There's a lot of things, but we want failure to be expensive, mm -hmm. right? We want it to burn something right. so that people can't abuse this to just hold up everything. Yeah. And without replace by fee, they can. Well, remember what I said about the time period? Mm -hmm. The compromise we made back in like 2016, I think, yeah. was when replace by fee was introduced. Basically, there was a way to turn it off. Mm. And that way to turn it off is the thing that causes problems. So what's called full replace by fee is to say, we will apply replace by fee rules to all transactions, regardless what, you know, whether or not they've tried to turn it off. Yeah, yeah. And that fixes this problem. And the beauty of it, too, is that miners are incentivized to do this because they earn a little bit more money. I mean. Realistically, people don't accept unconfirmed transactions anyway. Yeah. So this doesn't actually harm any real use case. But like so many political things, there's a small group of people who really, really hoped they could go sell this crazy scheme of like buying insurance for unconfirmed transactions and all this. So they've been very angry. But mm. you know, currently, like roughly 20, 30 percent of hashing power runs full replace by fee. Yeah. So I think that side has lost their argument. So is it mainly a matter of the miners upgrading to a client that would have replace by fee in it? Is that how you gain well, Remember, for this? so replace by fee that you could opt out of yeah. was in, introduced in 2016. Right. And basically all miners support that. I've never actually seen an exception mm -hmm. in um, recent history. Yeah. Um, full replace by fee, where you just apply those rules to all transactions, that seems to be adopted by like 20, 30% of hashing power. Right. And in Bitcoin Core, Last year, we added a command line flag, again, because of this multi-party transaction case mm -hmm. that allowed you to turn on full replace by fee easily. Yeah. And there's a whole political kerfuffle where people tried to get that, you know, by default off flag removed because we didn't want to allow people to adopt, repla you know, full replace by fee, which, sure. like, that's, I mean, it's, it's just such a ridiculous argument. It's like, you are not allowed to choose to enable this feature that is being written, it's literally a one-line code change. Yeah. It's trivial to do, but we're going to be so paternalistic, we're not even going to let you download code. 
and like this will somehow make Bitcoin secure. It's a ridiculous argument. But well, it seems so obvious that a user, a well-meaning user, could make a mistake, pay a low fee, and yeah. need to increase the fee. Yeah. As a feature, yeah. that seems very necessary. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, wallet authors really hate this opt-in thing because it just adds so much complexity. Sure. There's very occasional merchants who want you to send with replace by fee disabled. Mm -hmm. But, of course, you can highly, do it anyway. It's obviously highly suspect. I mean, why are they yeah, doing that? It's yeah. not a, well, it's not like, a, it doesn't give me a good feeling. Well, you know? And, you know, this is why things like Electrum, these days, um, you know, Electrum and a bunch of other wallets, there is no way to turn off this replace by fee bit. Yeah. Right, because that just makes the UI needlessly complex. I mean, do you really want to tell you, oh, by the way, like for this merchant, you got to go click this item to turn RBF off, and then you got to go pay like a good enough fee, which is actually like twice as expensive as you were expecting, because it's got to be really high to make sure all miners yeah, get yeah. it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bunch of nonsense. And if you screw you know? it up, your transaction is stuck forever. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. So, you know, they, it's much easier for wallets if replace by fees always enabled, you don't have to go deal with this nonsense. And, you know, this is why wallet authors were very in support of at least leaving this feature flag in. Sure. So that soon in the future we could get miners to adopt it. And what do you know? That's exactly what's happened. So at some point, I mean, I'm going to get around put, doing a pull request mm -hmm. to turn this on by default in Bitcoin Core. Yeah. You know, currently, it's, it's, it's hard to go tell. I, I, could, I, I should do some well, more measurements, but when I measured it last, of the nodes who had recently upgraded Bitcoin Core, like 20% mm -hmm. had turned on full replace by fee. Yeah. And uh, you know, a lot of other people turn it on. Um, good example is like BitPay. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, no, Bit yeah, yeah, B BTC Pay, BTC Pay. Sure, yeah. the That's open source alternative yes. to BitPay. Yes. yes, the open source alternative to BitPay. Similarly um, named to confuse yes. everyone forever, <laughs> but yes. Yes, BTC Pay, when you download their Docker image, the Bitcoin yes. Core it comes with turns on replace by fee by default, nice. or you know full replace sure, by fee. Because sure. obviously, if you're accepting money from people, I mean, you might as well go learn when they try to go double spend you, even if you're not going to ship them an item. Yeah, yeah. Like it's just the obvious thing to do, and it's just good for everyone mm -hmm. if it's turned on. So, well, it sounds like your mission of being involved and in making new things has been incredibly successful. How does that feel to see an industry you think you could get into? And I mean. I got into it, I made videos, well, I talked to people, that's been good too. But you actually got into the code and have made changes. But I mean, so, so, so this is interesting thing though, yeah. like this whole example replaced by fee. Yeah. All of the stuff I've done to advocate for it, for the most part, hasn't involved writing code. Hmm. You know, oh, way, I, I, that's interesting. Yeah. I, think people would find I mean, that. And, and you know, when I decided to go and quit the day job, if you will, and go to Bitcoin. Sure. One of the reasons why I decided to do it was because I realized, in, remember at the time, like 2014, the block size debate was mm -hmm. getting to ramp up. Oh, yeah. And I, I realized, looking at Bitcoin, not only is this interesting politically in, external to Bitcoin, mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, obviously Bitcoin as a thing has political implications, yeah, yeah. but within the Bitcoin system, there's a lot of interesting politics, because sure. Bitcoin's a consensus system. Yeah. Consensus fundamentally means making trade-offs between different users. That's right. You know, if you want to go do a zillion small on-chain transactions, and I want to run my node, we are in conflict. Absolutely. And that is a political bit debate. And that was one of the big things when I talked to Roger Veer during yeah. the block sign yeah. debate. He wanted to do those million micro transactions. Yep. He had some kind of a mess of his wallets where they all needed to be combined together, and yeah. he was paying a fee on each one of those, yeah. and he didn't and like we it. We just make the block size bigger. Make it bigger. I pay everything. smaller fees. Yeah. I can do it the way I, yeah. I can use Bitcoin the way I want to. Yeah. Was and I was very thought. active in that debate. Yeah, yeah. And you know, much the same as the replaced by fee debate. Did I actually write much code? No. But it's fascinating. You, know, you still you still have to kind of occupy a technical high ground. To be in the debate, you have to be able to write. You have to the be code. able to write the code, but you but, don't actually yeah. have to write it. Well, like again, replaced <laughs> by fee. Um, I wrote initial implementation of it. Yeah. It wasn't that great, but it did work. Mm -hmm. And then someone else, when it was merged to Bitcoin Core, they took my initial implementation, threw it out, yeah. and wrote it properly, with like better C plus plus coding. Sure, of course. And they were the ones who actually proposed the merge. Now, of course. I reviewed the pull request, I advocated for it and so on. Yeah, but yeah. I wasn't the one who actually wrote that code. Well, and you helped describe the problem, you understood the problem. Yeah. And I in advocated a lot of ways, for it. this reminds me of what's recently happened to Ben Ark, 
where he's working on LN bits and he's working on the ICD yeah. this and he puts them out there and people, you know, no offense, Ben, they're far greater coders come in and take these ideas to new heights like yeah. Fiat Joff with Noster. Yeah. You know, Ben's kind of throw off idea becomes a giant network because of Fiat Joff's coding, but he might have not even known or not even had that idea if Ben wasn't out there explaining it and pushing it in his own way with a prototype, with, yeah. a, with some working code, you know? It's interesting to see how both of you have been aided by the internet and larger forces and the idea of social all of us media. working together. And social media and conferences, that's, yeah. that's really what it comes down to. It allows yeah. you to get your message out there yep. and to attract the people you needed to help your projects. And interviews. That's <laughs> right. Well, that's fantastic, man. Anything else that you're working on uh, recently that you'd like to tell people about? Well, I mean, of course, I, I mentioned open time stamps mm -hmm. and uh, you know, this will sound kind of funny coming from a, a Bitcoiner, but you know, one of the issues open timestamps has right now is Bitcoin blocks don't actually have very precise time. You know, they have an end it time is, field. It is funny I, when I think about it because they're globally, they're everywhere, right? They're, yeah, well, I mean, the problem zone? is I mean, like I... a Bitcoin block, the block header has an end time field, which is second since 1970 with <laughs> second level precision. Oh, but you've got to ask yourself, does a miner actually need to put the right time in there? Like, how does a decentralized protocol enforce that? Yeah. And it turns out, it's a real mess. It's like miners I mean, can easily backdate their I don't know that miners blocks. would be incentivized to do this, but if they well, were just so, randomly so, wanted to do it so for there's, kicks, the, So I mean, there's two incentives in Bitcoin. Right. So, first of all, if you backdate your blocks, you would be artificially making difficulty go higher, mm. right? because now it looks like blocks are being produced faster. Right. So the difficulty should increase. Now, Bitcoin has a rule, and the rule isn't necessarily needed, but the rule is that the end time field in a block header has to be greater, um, I think it's, yeah, greater than the median of the past, like, 11 blocks. Right. Um, don't check the exact rule. There might be sure, greater sure. than or equal to, but that's basically that's basically yeah, the yeah. statement. Yeah. So you know, time has to like progress forward at least a little bit. Um, but certainly, if all the miners decide to backdate their blocks, they can do this, and they just lose. You know, their only reason they can't they don't do this because difficulty goes. If they up. all, as an industry, collaborated yeah. together, we're all going to set the blocks back. We're all going to tighten them up, make it look like more blocks, increase the difficulty. Yeah. And notably, if they decide to do that, say, on one day, and then just do it normal afterwards, for that day, there's no real problem there. Sure. Right? Because the block difficulty is over like the... It's like a protest or a Well, it's like the block difficulty yeah. is calculated over a chunk of blocks. Yeah. So if, you know, there's a day or two in there where it looks like maybe miners got really lucky, that has no effect overall which makes block timestamping a bit dubious because miners can go backwards, mm. right? Remember, timestamp is a stronger statement the further back in time it is. So right there, the majority of hashing power can screw with this, and that's a problem. The other thing is that in the other direction, the, you know, the only rule um, Bitcoin has to prevent miners from forward dating their blocks is n nodes on an individual basis will reject blocks that appear more than two hours into the future. But that's a really weird rule because it's not something there's consensus over. It just you seems know? like discrimination against time traveling well, miners. Yeah. I mean, but, I mean, but Doc more Brown went to all that like, work. You know? you know, you imagine you run a node, I run a node. Right. Our clocks are not going to be precisely the same. Definitely not. No. So on the same data at the same time, yeah. you might accept a block and I might reject it. Huh. And that's dubious. And we are very lucky that miners don't mess with this. Because there are certain cases where arguably miners do benefit sure. from having their blocks propagate less. Hmm. And you know, if push came to shove, if miners start messing with this, we'll probably increase those limits or something. But it's, it's not really clear what the hell you do about this. So that's just ugly. But from a point of view of open timestamps, both these things are potential problems. Hmm. So. I would like to do better. Unfortunately, in a decentralized system, it's hard to imagine how would a decentralized system come to agreement on time, right? There's no reliable way to do this, but there is one simple thing to do, which is throw a trust at the problem. And you know, I, on my to-do list is to add a trusted timestamping component to open timestamps. And the way it would work, um, and I'm already doing this in more, you know, less integrated ways, but yeah. basically, if you want to trust miners, 
Well, you can at least say that there will be a trusted time in the timestamp that makes sure that the time that you think the timestamp represents isn't less than a certain period of time. Right. Right. So you do a timestamp. We'll use dates to make this simple. Yeah. At January first. Okay. Right. Miners say it's December thirty-first. Mm. Right. In the past. Yeah. The trusted part would enforce that your client would say, well, maybe the time is earlier than that, but it's certainly you know, not earlier than the January 1st, because we're right. going to put that as a threshold. Yeah, yeah. And your client would pop up saying, hey, that timestamp represents January 1st. Maybe the miner said it was earlier, but we're not going to trust them. We're going to say January 1st at least. right? And that makes the timestamp weaker, but more likely be accurate. The other thing you can do if you're willing to go trust an entity is say, well, that entity claimed that the time when it received that document was exactly, you know, January 1st, like 10 minutes after midnight. Well, you if know, the contract demands that, it might be necessary, right? A lot of legal well, contracts so, and things well, are... Well, look at know? my example in Guatemala. In yeah. Guatemala, the difference between a ballot that was very suspect and a ballot that wasn't was a matter of hours. Yeah. I mean, arguably a matter of minutes in some cases. Sure. So if you can't trust miners within like a day, you know, which is, which is what the client shows by default, yeah. obviously you have a problem there. And the trusted time stamping component would go help with that because you at least say, well, those entities make that claim, miners reinforce this claim. Right. And now we have a lot of different evidence for a lot of different angles. And in fact, um, I have two projects, one mm -hmm. called NIST Inject, and they're called Restamp. And they look at this problem from two different angles. Mm -hmm. One is NIST Inject says, so there's an idea of something called a random beacon. Okay. And the random beacon creates random numbers that everyone knows about okay. once they're created, but no one can predict. Sure. NIST, the US government agency, they run one of these random beacons. And they're making the claim that these numbers were created after a point in time. Sure. Well, I have a, it's basically a script that runs. Yeah. Every you know two minutes, it downloads the current NIST random beacon, right. as well as a bunch of other blockchains like you know LTC, Ethereum, Monero, etc. Yeah. Takes all those hashes, all those numbers that were unpredictable in the past, mm -hmm. timestamps them with Bitcoin, wow. right? And now we've created a dependency. So this Bitcoin block must have been created after all those things were created. Yeah. And if someone manually looks at it, they can look at this, these databases right. and say, hang on a second, you know, NIST says that, if we, we believe NIST, that block was created after this point. Mm -hmm. I also have another thing using something called rough time, which is a time synchronization standard. Yeah. But the way the time synchronization standard works is, I create a random number, a nonce, I send it off to you, the time authority, yeah. you put your digital signature, your trusted timestamp sure. on it, and you send it back to me. Yeah. Well, I know how many seconds passed from, I created that nonce, sure. sent it to you, and I got it back. Yeah. And I can do a bit of arithmetic to figure mm -hmm. out, well, you said the time was this, yeah. it took this long to get there and back, right. thus the time must be in this time window, and I can then set my clock. But the beautiful thing is, that's also a timestamp. Mm -hmm. And it's a timestamp that, among others, Cloudflare is running. Yeah. You know, Cloudflare runs a rough time server. Mm -hmm. So now I have another script yeah. that whenever Bitcoin blocks are found by a um, very well connected node I run, mm -hmm. it goes off to with rough time and timestamps that block with a few different places. And then in turn, I take those timestamps and re-timestamp with them in the Bitcoin. Yeah. So in the future, if you're wondering when exactly was this Bitcoin block created, right. you can constrain you can it within this, but with NIST in rough time yeah, by manually looking at all this data. Mm -hmm. Now, are you going to do that? Well, sometimes you might. You could get a script to check the data. I'm I mean, sure. you can I easily mean... manually look at this for an important timestamp, but at least the data is there. And yeah. I've been collecting this stuff for a few years now, so. You know, all these historical records exist. And like I say, I want to improve the open timestamps protocol by making better ways to do all this. I think it's really interesting because you know, I'm trained as a historian. I yep. read all the books. And you know, a lot of times it's just you holding up a newspaper in a photograph yep. proves that date, proves that newspaper, yep. proves that location. Yep. 
There's a lot of fascinating information there. Yeah. And it sounds like what you're talking about is attaching a dozen different newspaper articles hold yeah. up to that yeah. thing, just adding more and more proof to the point where maybe I messed up the Ethereum one, yeah. but I didn't mess up the Litecoin yep. one. And if you have eight out of nine, you're gonna believe the eight very easily yeah. compared to the one that I well, can manipulate. Well, funny you mention newspapers, because um, one of the better known trusted time stamping solutions is guard time. And What's Guard that? Time, famously pre-Bitcoin, mm -hmm. ran its own blockchain <laughs> of all of the trusted time stamping signatures. Yeah. So you could go audit them. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things they did to, you know, to not be part of that trust chain directly yeah. was they periodically take the hash of the most recent block in this time chain yeah. and publish it in newspapers. <laughs> and you can actually find like these Guard Time publications wow. in uh, archival newspaper records. Yeah. I mean, uh, they probably still do it. I, I don't know for sure. I've, I've sure. never looked recently, but you know, that, that was a big part of their advertising back in like the early 2000s. Like, look, you're not just trusting us. Like, there's also in like, you know, the New York Times and stuff in the classified section. Well, and in the business world, when you're working for lawyers and things, so many people depend on these timestamps. Yep. They need to know the information about this, and there really is a real world, you know, contracts, deals, all kinds of things where you need to know the truth of was it delivered on time? You know, well, is it yeah, and particularly with contract, like there's a lot of cases where if you wanted to falsify a contract, you don't know how you would do it till later. You know, the, the opportunity to do it comes later after you sure. screwed up in some way and you realize, oh shit, I wish the contract said this instead of but this. But if you, if you put an empty envelope in the file and you can replace it with another envelope later, then yeah, you have yeah. the plan by then. I yeah. can see that. So, you know, it just makes everyone's life easy if you can timestamp stuff. And because timestamping is so scalable, mm -hmm. frankly, you might as well. I mean, one of the things I did uh, a few years back was I took the metadata of the Internet Archive. Because yeah. you can download the metadata, like sure. the hash of the files. And I downloaded like 50 terabytes of metadata, yeah. the enormous amount of stuff. Yeah, unbelievable. It was like half a, half, you know, half a billion documents. <laughs> and I put them in one gigantic Merkle tree and I timestamped this. Nice. And I actually had, I did some work to do this on an ongoing basis, although frankly, my, uh, the computers I had available couldn't keep up with it. That's you know? right. I didn't want to spend a bunch of money on this you project. Need a lot could, more, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I could have spent like 200 bucks a month on a server that would have sure. kept up with this, but I figured, you know, I don't really have the budget for this. <laughs> and I, I, I was in talks to get the Internet Archive yeah, to yeah. integrate this within their own system, so sure. they would just do time stamping. Yeah. But unfortunately, I, uh, I met with them in person once, yeah. Meeting went great, everyone agreed this was a great idea, et cetera, et cetera. But there's like one dude who just spoke up at the end of the meeting, look, this uses Bitcoin, we will never do this. Bitcoin is bad for the environment. Was it, was it Jason Scott? <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was him. I don't think he was in that meeting. It was some other guy. But I, feel, I mean, I feel Jason so, might be against it too. I feel so bad. I mean, I, I love his Twitter account and I've been yeah. following him since I saw him do a textfiles.com yep. at DEF CON a million years ago. Yeah. But and he hates I love, Bitcoin. I love the idea of text files. Yeah. I love what he does with the archive. Yeah. I love his Twitter and the way he's paying off the IRS by doing live shows and stuff. But yes, he hates Bitcoin. Yep. And so many I never want to mention it to him because he'll ban me. He's very much like, yeah. I will ban and block anyone that yeah. mentions Bitcoin to me. And he's, he's very big at the archive and I love his work yeah. there. But yeah, he's, he just disagrees with us about yeah. Bitcoin. So that's oh, it's kind of sad. Because like, you'd think that the archive and time yeah. things would go right together. Yeah. Uh, I've been there many times and they're great uh, people. I, you, you know, know I mean, frankly, any time you archive data, you might as well timestamp it. It's well, just so that's easy. Why, I mean, when I got into Bitcoin, you know, I'm coming from lawyers and corporate databases and stuff. Yeah. I already knew how important timestamps and dates yeah. and sort by date were. And when I saw Bitcoin, I mean, it didn't have open timestamps yeah. in my head. It kind of did already because yeah. the blockchain was proving time. Yeah. And putting things in there, you know, at a basic level was proving yeah. it, which yeah. previously we had no way to accurately do other than yeah. the newspaper well, holdup. I mean, we had know. guard time. And I'll point out, I mean, guard time is a commercial service. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, it's been quite successful. There really is demand for this. I, I Although agree. I, totally agree I will caveat that by pointing out, I think guard time's real business model is not so much that they create timestamps. It's that they create timestamps where if you have a court case where they come up, they will make sure that expert witnesses attest to these timestamps <laughs> and make sure that this does not get disproven in court. Sure. And as far as I can tell, you know, no one, at least in the U.S. federal system, has gotten to a point where timestamp was make or break on. Well, the case, I, I yeah. guess what I say is like, no one has gotten to a point where timestamp was disputed. Because remember, usually the way courts 
you know, like trials work is the, you know, my lawyers and your lawyers, we do a ton of communication before yeah. it actually gets to court. Sure. We reveal each other evidence. And if there's something time stamped, chances are at some point I'll, we'll, you know, we'll explain to you, look, you can't go and dispute this. Yeah. Like if you try, you're going to well, lose. That's, that's the evidence I'm trying to tell you. When I get the phone yeah. records or if I analyze someone's computer forensically, yeah. pretty much in a very rare case where the IT person would mess it up or yeah. intentionally change it, the date is the date. The yeah. phone call is the phone call. Yeah. I'm not, as an IT person, I don't have time to fake a bunch of phone records. Yeah. I'm accurately yeah. presenting the data yeah. I've been given. It happens and, occasionally, know. but for the most part, not. And yeah. I mean, time stamps are a great and, way to yeah. like really rule that out. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic yeah. system. It's a great addition to Bitcoin that yep. you worked out. So, well, thanks so much, Peter, for yeah, the interview. Thank you. I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah.